Aloha, my name is Roy Kodani, and I will be hosting the uh, Life in the Law segment of the Think Tech uh, program. My uh, host, my guest this afternoon will be James Kawachika. As we all know, uh, life uh, has become very complicated, and a great part of our lives is uh, uh, controlled or it pertains to law. And one of the main questions that I have been asked as an attorney is how do you find an attorney for your particular problem or issue? And having found such an attorney, how do you go about um, hiring such an attorney? This afternoon, my guest will be James Kawachika. He is an attorney. And uh, Jim, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Roy. And uh, thank you for coming. Well, it's a pleasure and a privilege for me to be asked to participate in the debut of your new program. Oh, thank you very much. Now, Jim, uh, for the uh, sake of the viewers, could you uh, give us your uh, educational back background and your current professional background? Well, I did my undergraduate work at the University of Hawaii, and uh, I went on from there to the University of California at Berkeley for law school. Graduated from the University of California at Berkeley, and uh, went right back, came back to Hawaii, and uh, became a deputy attorney general for the state of Hawaii, and advised uh, the, the Department of Health in environmental matters at that time. And from there, I was recruited into the private practice of law. And I've been practicing with both large and small firms since that time. Uh, this September, I will be celebrating 42 years in the practice of law. Congratulations, Jim. Thank you. Maybe for the uh, uh, information for the um, viewing public, could you tell us the difference between private practice and other practices in Hawaii? Well, uh, the difference between basically between a public practice and a private practice is that in a public practice you're basically representing a governmental agency. In the private practice of law, uh, you're basically handling legal problems that are encountered by uh, the man on the street. Um, you're representing individuals or companies who get into a legal dispute or need particular kinds of documents drafted for their particular purposes, be it a state planning or a business agreement of some kind. Could you also uh, elaborate on your uh, uh, public service, if any, and any awards you have uh, received from uh, societies or groups in Hawaii or nationally? Yeah, well, I have, um, you know, served as president of the Hawaii State Bar Association. Uh, I have served for six years as a member of the disciplinary board of the Hawaii Supreme Court and a good part of that time as chair of the disciplinary board. I have also been the president and board member, current board member of the Hawaii Justice Foundation. I'm a past director of the Legal Aid Society of Hawaii. Uh, I'm a current board member of the American Judicature Society. And most recently, I've begun to chair the Hawaii Judicial Selection Commission. Again, for the sake of the public, could you uh, elaborate on what a Judicial Selection Commission is? Um, the, the Judicial Selection Commission is really the body uh, that's been uh, formed to help vet candidates for judicial office. Um, we accept applications from lawyers who may apply for one judicial uh, judge position or another. Uh, we are required <coughs> to interview the applicants and then uh, depending upon the appointment, uh, 
select a short list of names to be either submitted to the Chief Justice of the Hawaii Supreme Court for selection of one of the members on the short list or to the governor of the state of Hawaii for his selection of one uh, of the members of the short list that we provide. What is the short list that you talk about today? Uh, the short list is the, the names of the candidates that we have winnowed down uh, to submit to the appointing authority. And the appointing authority would be? Either the chief justice or the governor. Right. Let us go uh, to the uh, main question that is before us this afternoon, and that is, how does a person who has a legal dispute or legal issue or may need legal advice find an attorney in Honolulu or in Hawaii? How does it go, he or she go about hiring such an attorney? And uh, what is the process of such a, uh, seeking out of a attorney to represent him or her? Yeah, I think the best resource for finding an attorney is probably word of mouth. Uh, it would be like anything else. If I were trying to go and find a doctor mm -hmm. to handle or treat me for uh, a condition involving my knee, I think one of the first resources that I would go to would be family, friends, or colleagues, people who have had uh, a doctor treat them for the particular or similar type of problem uh, to ask them for recommendations as to um, doctors that they feel have done a good job uh, and similarly in the legal field I think when you're looking for a lawyer first and foremost um, one of your best resources is to talk to family friends colleagues and and actually other lawyers or if you have friends that know lawyers to ask those friends, to ask those lawyers if, if they could recommend somebody to handle the particular kind of problem or legal need that you have. Um, so word of mouth, I think, first and foremost, is probably the best way to go. Let me just stop you here for a minute. When I started practicing law several years ago, uh, lawyers would uh, then advertise when it became permissible to advertise that they handle all types of law. Now today, why would it be necessary or uh, advisable to hire an attorney who is qualified in that specific area of the law which the client may have an issue or problem? Well, I think, I think you certainly want to hire someone that has handled a similar type of problem before, successfully, hopefully, so that you're not walking uh, into court with a lawyer that has never handled the kind of problem that you've entrusted him with. Um, similarly, I don't think you would want to hire a doctor who had never performed surgery before and you're his first patient in that respect. So. Uh, it's important that you find somebody that's uh, experienced, that somebody, based on your interview with the lawyer, you feel you can work with, have an easy time communicating with, and that you feel has some empathy and understanding for the problem that you're going through. Besides uh, talking to friends uh, or other lawyers uh, about finding a lawyer, what other source would you recommend or suggest well, there are secondary sources uh, uh, like what we call the Martindale Hubble Law Directory. And what the Martindale Hubble Law Directory is, is a law directory that's created by a company called Martindale Hubble that um, covers the entire United States. And what they do is they create this directory, which is probably included in something like four different volumes. And what they do, in addition to listing lawyers who have uh, subscribed to the publication to have their profile listed in the directory itself, what Martindale Hubble does is also go around the country, Hawaii included, 
and rates lawyers based on uh, interviews that they've done of your colleagues in the legal community. And based on those comments, they will either rate you with, give you an AV rating, a BV rating, or a CV rating, or no rating at all, if not enough no lawyers know about you in the community. An AV rating is the highest rating that you can attain. It says that you have you know, superior legal ability. The V of the AV stands for very high ethical uh, uh, standards um, aspired to by the attorney. So um, they will, Martindale Hubble will go and interview other lawyers in your particular community and they will ask those lawyers about you, or they will ask uh, those other lawyers who they would go to if they had a legal problem. And if you get enough positive comments about yourself, you will get rated, and mm -hmm. you will get rated either an AV, BV, or CV rating Jim, based on that. If I were um, seeking to get a higher or higher rating, can I write to Martin Dale Hubble and give information about myself to Martin Dale? You could, yeah. but I don't think that in and of itself is going to necessarily cause them to rate you or to raise the rating <laughs> that they may have previously given to you. It is one factor that they would take into consideration based on a number of other things. I think the thing that they probably give the most weight to is listening to what other lawyers in the legal community have to say about you because I think they feel, and rightfully so, mm -hmm. that those are the people that would know best what your abilities are because they've either faced you mm -hmm. uh, or dealt with you on the other side of a case or they have heard about you through reputation in the community. Where do I go about finding Martindale Humble? Martindale this, this Hubble, full volume. Yeah, Martindale Hubble, and, and you know, I believe in show and tell, Roy. Good. So I brought with me today mm -hmm. uh, at least the volume that um, has all the, not all of the Hawaii lawyers, but the, those lawyers that subscribe to the publication listed. And this is volume two, and it includes lawyers in a number of different states, but, but this is the one that includes the lawyers from Hawaii. Hawaii. Um, and you can get a hold of this at either the Hawaii Supreme Court Library, mm -hmm. the uh, William S. Richardson Law School Library, and I'm pretty sure they would have it at the State Library as well. And uh, if I were to go to the State Library or the Richard, uh, Richardson Law School Library, uh, I would be I would have access to this Martindale Hubble. Yes. All right. uh, let me ask you, are there any other uh, sources that one can go to to find out about a particular lawyer? An another good secondary source is mm -hmm. um, something called Best Lawyers in America put out by Woodward White, Wright, White I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Inc. Um, publishers. And uh, this is again a national publication, but again, they do a very good job of um, coming into the community and having other lawyers rate your performance in this community. And uh, if they get enough of a feedback from other lawyers, uh, okay. you will be honored enough to be included in the best lawyers in America. Honolulu Magazine does a takeoff from the best lawyers in America at least with regard to Hawaii lawyers. So they have uh, every other year, one of their publications is devoted to the best lawyers in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. But it's basically done off of the ratings that are made in the Best Lawyers of America publication. If I can just interrupt, Jim. Uh, for the viewing public, if uh, you are uh, interested in uh, having your question answered, you may tweet us at uh, Think Tech Hawaii. And that's Think Tech Hawaii. Now, Jim, besides uh, these sources, uh, 
Many of my friends who are not familiar with lawyers in Hawaii have a tendency to look at the yellow pages of the telephone directory. What are your thoughts about uh, yellow pages? Some of these yellow pages are a full-blown page, mm -hmm. uh, and they talk about themselves. How reliable is it to rely on such a yellow page ad? You know, I think you, what your viewers need to understand is mm -hmm. that obviously the yellow pages will print whatever advertisement uh, you want them to print provided that you pay them for the space in the yellow mm -hmm. pages or if uh, a lawyer were to buy an ad in the newspaper or a magazine. Um, they're basically, these are marketing tools that lawyers uh, uh, put together. Uh, but they've never been rated, they've never been mm -hmm. vetted by any national organization. So you need to be really careful about using uh, things like the yellow page advertisements um, in, in selecting a lawyer that's experienced in the area that you're interested in. Thank you, Jim. Uh. This is Alice Lee Hagen, host of Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My show here at Think Tech Hawaii is every Thursday from 3 to 4 in the afternoon. I bring in interesting guests from Hawaii, the mainland, and hopefully international guests in the future. Do join us on Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Aloha. Aloha. My name is PJ, and I'm the host of Hawaii Sports Update. I am very interested in local sports, and that's why I host the Hawaii sports update show. I bring in guests from Hawaii, I bring in guests from UH, I bring in guests from the community, I bring in big names, I bring in small names, I bring in all names that are community related and doing positive things sports related in the community. Come join me every Tuesday at 1 p.m. here on Hawaii Sports Update. You can also join me on my golf tournament, the first annual PJ Sports Radio Show Golf Tournament. It's going to be held at Coral Creek. For any information, go to Think Tech Hawaii, I-N-C, and friend us. The PayPal and a summary of the event will be right there, available for you. And don't forget to tweet us. Jim, uh, to continue, what, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what uh, <clears throat> other sources are there in Hawaii for finding a, uh, an attorney. Yeah. A, a third resource that you might have is the Hawaii State Bar Association Lawyer Referral Service. Mm -hmm. And what the Hawaii State Bar Association Lawyer Referral Service is, is really uh, lawyers in Hawaii can sign up with the Lawyer Referral Service. So they put their names on a list, and uh, uh, if, the, if a potential client is looking for a lawyer they can call the Hawaii State Bar Association and say you know I need a lawyer in the landlord tenant area uh, can you recommend or give me the names of three lawyers in that particular area and the Bar Association will look at their list of lawyers who practice in that particular area that have signed up for the service and will give the names of uh, three of those lawyers to that potential person, potential client, to follow up with. Are they rated by the uh, Bar Association? They are not rated by the Bar Association. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to understand that the lawyers pay to have their names listed on the Hawaii State Bar Association Lawyer Referral Service. There is, in certain areas of the law, a pre-qualification questionnaire that the lawyer has to fill out. Um, in order to qualify them to list their names under a particular area of the law. For example, employment law, family law, tort law, or criminal law. You need to pre-qualify yourself with the Hawaii State Bar Association and attest to them that you know, you've handled at least three cases in a particular uh, segment of that of that area of the law so that mm -hmm. you, 
the Hawaii State Bar Association can be somewhat assured that you're, you know, you've handled Have cases experience. of this type uh, of case before. Let me uh, just interrupt uh, a minute, Jim. Again, I would like to um, say to the viewing public that uh, we have a twi tweet, and you can tweet us here at Think Tech Hawaii, H-I. And all right. thank you. Now, Jim, having gone through this process of uh, trying to find a lawyer for your particular problem or issue, what is the next step? Uh, before you before you answer, let me ask you this: What what are your views or your opinion about interviewing several attorneys before you decide? I think that's a good idea if you have the time. But you and I know that you know the the normal public is not gonna is not gonna take the time to interview two or three lawyers. They're gonna get a name that's recommended to them by a friend, family, or colleague, or other lawyer. And they're going to go in and interview and sit with that lawyer. And if they feel comfortable with that lawyer, practically speaking, that's where they're going to end up. All right. Have but it, it is, you know, if you have the time and, and, and the willingness to do it, it's great if, if you can go out and interview two or three lawyers to find the one that you really feel comfortable with. Having found a lawyer who you feel comfortable with, yeah. what is the next step that the uh, layperson, the public, ought to do? Well, I think one, one of the most important things you do is to enter into an agreement with the lawyer as to what the lawyer is going to bill you for and how much. Uh, preferably get that in writing from the lawyer so there's no question down the road mm -hmm. as to what your obligation uh, is for payment of his fees for the work that he's going to do for you. Jim, Although there is no requirement right now for a lawyer to get uh, a retention agreement in writing. Let me ask you, from my experience, uh, it seems that the subject of fees is a very sensitive subject to discuss, both from the client's position and from the attorney's position. Um, would it be your recommendation that this be discussed openly and comprehensively? Very much so. I think uh, that's one of the most important things that you can try to have resolved in the first meeting with the lawyer. As you say, there's a natural hesitancy, even on the part of the lawyer, to tell the client or potential client uh, how much they think they're worth. And there's a natural hesitancy on the part of the client to kind of push that envelope and bring that issue up. But it's so critical that there be a frank discussion of that because, you know, you can have the greatest case in the world and the lawyer can be totally enthusiastic about the case, but when you find out how much he's going to charge you for it, you may not be as enthusiastic about that lawyer as a result. So... It's important to get that out right up front. Now, as to fees, I understand uh, that there are different kinds of fees. Uh, could you describe the different fees that lawyers charge? Right. And, and you know, l let me go back a little bit. Sure. I said before that right now retention or retention or engagement agreements with the lawyer don't have to be in writing, and that's true. There is an exception to that, and that is where a client enters into what's called a contingency fee agreement with a lawyer. In that case, a contingency fee agreement must always be in writing. That is a requirement. Okay. What is a contingency fee agreement? What are the different types of fee agreements that there are? A lawyer can charge you based on uh, an hourly billing basis. Uh, your, if your hourly rate Excuse is up. Me. Is that negotiable? Uh, it, the, it depends on the lawyer. Mm -hmm. You know, so let's say a lawyer charges $150 an hour or $200 an hour. Um, you know, it, 
you, you can, as, an, as a potential client, ask if there is any uh, leeway on, on that hourly fee. Um, and it's really up to the lawyer as to what he wants to do in terms of adjusting the fee for you. But so the first type of fee agreement is the hourly fee agreement, where the lawyer charges you for his work on an hourly basis at a set rate per hour. The second kind of fee agreement is what we call a fixed fee agreement. So if you go to a lawyer and he says, I will do your divorce mm -hmm. for $5,000 from soup to nuts, um, you know at the outset that that's the, the, the ultimate amount that he's ever going to charge you to get the divorce done is $5,000. Jim, what happens if the divorce proceeding or the proceeding or the dispute becomes more complex than what the attorney anticipated or the, even the client anticipated? Uh, the lawyer is bound by the agreement that you have with him. So he takes a risk in agreeing to a fixed fee at the beginning of the case. And if he agrees to do a particular case for $5,000, no matter how complicated it may become down the road, he's still stuck with that $5,000 maximum amount. Um, it's subject to negotiation or amendment if he feels like, boy, I entered into a really improvident kind of an agreement, he might come back to you and ask you if you would be willing to amend the agreement to allow him to charge you more, but it's really at, you, at, at your discretion and option as to whether you want to allow that to, to happen or not. Jim, as far as uh, contingency fee arrangements are concerned, what about the cost of uh, the litigation? And let me go back. Sure. Contingency fee agreement is the third type of R. agreement that there are. All so right. we have the hourly billing arrangement, the fixed fee arrangement, and now we have the contingency All right. fee arrangement. Contingency fee arrangements or agreements are typically used in personal injury type cases. And what that really is, is an agreement by the lawyer to handle your case and that if he is not able to achieve a settlement or a trial judgment in your favor, then you pay nothing for his services. But if he is able to achieve a settlement or a, a judgment award in a particular amount, you agree to pay him a particular percentage of that settlement or judgment. Now, with regard to that contingency fee agreement, you ask, well, what happens about costs? What, who pays the costs? Uh, depending on the contingency fee agreement, that cost, those costs could be absorbed by the lawyer. It just depends on what the lawyer is agreeing to do. Some lawyers will absorb the cost. So that if you totally lose the case, you walk away as a client from that paying nothing. Other contingency fee agreements provide that you will only be responsible for paying for a lawyer's fee if he is successful. But if, even if he is not successful, you're still bound to pay at least his out-of-pocket expenses. What are these out-of-pocket expenses? Well, if he, if he has to go hire an expert to testify in your case, or if he has to uh, file a document with the court and has to pay a filing fee, those are all costs associated with the litigation, which are separate from the contingency fee paid to the lawyer. <coughs> is, this, is this discussed when uh, the client meets with the attorney? Yes. And this should be made clear from the very onset. Absolutely. And uh, uh, this, let me ask you this. What happens if the cost becomes uh, so high and the, uh, the client is obligated to pay, and he loses the case, what happens in such a case? Well, I think, I think again, at that point, let's assume that mm. the client, at the inception of the case, agreed to pay for the costs involved in the case. Um, but as you say, 
that cost at the end of the case and an, an unsuccessful case that those costs are very high it's really at the discretion of the lawyer as to whether he will insist that you pay for the cost no matter how much it is at that point all right we are going to take a brief uh, commercial break thank you Okay, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ray Starling. We co-host a show called Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, every Wednesday, 4 to 5 p.m. It's really interesting. You know, Ray has a way of unzipping these guys. He asks them his question, and all this stuff tumbles out, and we find out stuff we would never know about without Ray's questions. Thank you, Ray. You're welcome, uh, Jay. I, I'm very pleased to be your um, Ed McMahon uh, <laughs> every Wednesday at 4 o'clock here uh, on, uh, on the internet. So you can join us and see what's happening in the energy world. And there is a lot going on. So join us uh, every Wednesday at 4 o'clock. Yeah, come around. Be energized right here on ThinkTech. Aloha. How you doing? I'm Gordon the Texar here on Think Tech Hawaii, where we co-host Hibachi Talk, where we talk about technology and bring in all kinds of cool guests. Also, my co-host with me today is Andrew. Andrew, the, Andrew, the security guy. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching Think Tech Hawaii, and thanks for watching Hibachi Talk. We also have Angus. Have you met a lab? It's Angus. I bring in all kinds of wee things. Oh, look, you see my lips moving. <laughs> <laughs> We are, this afternoon, uh, this uh, interview is called Life in the Law. And uh, I am your host. My name is Roy Kodani. And you can tweet us here at Think Tech Hawaii. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to contact us. Now, Jim, to get back, uh, let me ask you, uh, Having hired the attorney, what are important factors for the client to consider or to bear in mind? I think uh, I want to raise two, two important uh, issues that you need to be aware of as a client of the lawyer. One is the importance of maintaining the attorney-client privilege. What is the attorney-client privilege? Mm -hmm. Most people are aware of it. Um, Whatever you tell the lawyer or whatever the lawyer tells you in the course of his work for you is considered to be confidential communication. And no one, no one can intrude and say and, and try to find out what was said by you to the lawyer or what was said by the lawyer to you in the course of your receiving legal advice from the lawyer. Um, and that's really, the, 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 the reason for that is to, uh, the reason for the confidentiality cloak is so that a client feels totally comfortable divulging his worst secrets to the lawyer so that the lawyer can help him. So you want to encourage the client to tell the lawyer all about his story or his side of the story, warts and all. And to encourage that, we have what's called the attorney-client privilege, which is that whatever you tell the lawyer, the lawyer is duty-bound not to disclose to anyone. And no one can make him um, disclose it to anyone. Jim, would the, that be also applicable to the attorney secretary, the paralegal in the office? Yes. Right. They are also bound by the same confidentiality requirement. Now. There's a caveat to that attorney-client privilege, and that is the only person that can waive that privilege is the client. Okay? The attorney can't waive it, mm -hmm. the paralegal can't waive it, the secretary can't waive it. The only person that can possibly waive that protection is the client. How does he waive such so a privilege? If the client goes out and he tells a third person, mm -hmm. this is what I discuss with my lawyer, and divulges that information outside of the lawyer-client relationship, 
that is cons that constitutes a waiver of the privilege or protection. And if the other side should ever find out about it, other side of the case, the, your opponent, your opponent would have the right to question that third party witness and find out from that third party witness everything that you discussed with your lawyer that you then shared with that third party witness. And there is no protection anymore. So it's extremely important mm -hmm. that you as a client, your viewers as a client, recognize and observe and religiously follow that requirement or that admonition that they don't go out and disclose to anyone else on the outside what it is that they discussed with their attorney. What is the second uh, factor? That I you... think the second factor, important thing that, that you might want to discuss with your attorney in that first meeting is if Roy uh, you're with a law firm, a big law firm, and I come to see you to hire you. I want to be assured that uh, Roy Kodani is going to be the one doing the work, handling the major portions of my case. He's the one that's going to be trying my case if the case has to go to trial. Um, and if that is important to you as a client, then you should make that known to the lawyer so that you don't find yourself in a situation where months down the road, suddenly Roy Kodani uh, is no longer around and he has his associate working with you, um, which sometimes happens because what lawyers like to do is to downstream the work to someone who will charge less on an hourly basis, but someone who is junior to you but maybe less experienced as a result. Uh, if it's important to you to have Roy Kodani handling your case, then you need to make that clear. So that understanding is there on the table in the beginning. And that attorney, Roy Kodani, can say, well, if you're gonna expect me to be available at all times, I don't think I'm your lawyer because I'm so busy doing other things that I can't handle your case personally um, uh, as you would want. Jim, there's another common uh, notion in the community, and this is uh, applicable in divorce cases. Many times uh, people say, uh, my husband and I hired the same attorney to do the divorce papers and the proceeding. Would, would that be considered a conflict between client and attorney? How does that? You know, typically you don't like, a lawyer doesn't, especially in a, in a divorce situation, a lawyer does not want to represent both husband and wife in the divorce. Um, you might possibly be able to do that if both sides have agreed upon everything and they merely want to use the lawyer as a scribe to mm -hmm. actually ink the deal together. But otherwise, everything's been agreed to between husband and wife, and they just need to have a lawyer put it in the form of a written agreement that'll stand up in court. Um, and even in doing that, a lawyer needs to be very, very careful mm -hmm. because he has to be totally neutral in his work. He cannot be siding with the husband in drafting a particular term or provision of the agreement. And, he, and, and by the same token, he cannot be unduly coveting or favorable to the wife. Jim, for the sake of time this afternoon, uh, let us take the uh, situation where the client becomes dissatisfied with his attorney. Right. What then happens? Well. If a client is dissatisfied with the attorney, let's say because the attorney is not returning his or her calls or not doing the work, my first uh, uh, suggestion would be to try to sit down with the attorney and air out these grievances with the attorney to try to get them resolved. It may be purely a misunderstanding. It may be the client's misunderstanding of what the lawyer is supposed to do uh, or it may be a misunderstanding on the part of the lawyer as to what the client expects to be done. But 
First and foremost, my suggestion is communicate with one another. Sit down. Sometimes that's not possible because you're not even getting the lawyer to call you back. Mm -hmm. That's an even bigger problem. If the lawyer is not responding back to you despite the fact that you've left several phone calls or written several letters to him asking him for information, uh, I think at that point you really need to seriously consider uh, whether or not you want to continue on with that lawyer if he's going to you know, perform that way. And you need to seriously consider whether you need to disengage, you need to fire the lawyer. What if um, in such a situation you find that the attorney has uh, committed some, shall we say, unethical uh, violations in your mind? What, what uh, source or what agency or what commission does the client have that he can go to, to well there's, there's probably two that you can go to the first and foremost is the office of disciplinary counsel the office of disciplinary counsel is our ethics police among lawyers and basically if you believe that your <clears throat> lawyer has acted uh, unethically vis-a-vis uh, -vis you uh, you have the right to file a grievance with the Office of Disciplinary Counsel, a complaint with the Office of Disciplinary Counsel, um, and the Office of Disciplinary Counsel will then uh, investigate the matter on your behalf. They will contact the lawyer. They will get the lawyer's side of the story. And if they believe, as a result of their investigation, that there has been an ethics breach, by the lawyer. They will actually prosecute the lawyer for the ethical violation. For the sake of time, Jim, what is the second? The second agency that you could possibly go to, assuming that there is dishonest conduct on the part of the lawyer and you've lost money as a result, is the lawyer's fund for client protection. And the lawyer's fund for client protection is a fund that's been set up by the Hawaii Supreme Court, which is funded by all the Hawaii mm. lawyers, uh, which is set up really to to um, pay off on claims of dishonest lawyers who have now absconded from the community. I see. Um, Jim, we have a question from the public, and let me just read the question. So if I find my lawyers isn't too hot, how exactly do I get rid of him? That I think you answered. The more critical question here, I believe, is the next question. Will the next lawyer hold this against me? Well, mm. I, I think first of all, just to, just to reiterate on the first question, a client should not feel enslaved to the lawyer simply because he's, he or she has signed an engagement or retention agreement with the lawyer. You have the right in all circumstances to disengage or discontinue your relationship if you believe that at some point, the lawyer is not doing the job that you want him to do. You have that prerogative. Now, how will this affect the next lawyer that you go to to handle your case? Well, it's going to be of interest to the next lawyer, right? Because I, if, if, if someone has fired the first lawyer and is coming to me to handle a case, one of the first questions I'm going to ask is, uh, why did you fire that lawyer? Because I don't want, I as the next lawyer in line, is not want, to not, want, not want to get myself into the same situation as the first lawyer. But uh, if there's a perfectly logical explanation, uh, it will not affect me. For example, if you tell me that that lawyer has not been returning his phone calls or has not been working diligently on your case, then that's an understandable gripe or complaint that the client has and is a good reason to disengage from that lawyer, and, and I, as the second lawyer in line, would not hold it against you. Jim, uh, thank you for being my guest this afternoon. Uh, you have answered a very critical and important question that many lay uh, members of the public have, and I think you did a great job in answering uh, that very important question. Thank, thank you. you very much thank for you. coming thank this afternoon. Thank you for asking me. Yeah, thank you.